There you go. Okay, we're rolling. Uh, believe it or not, I'm going to get on my soapbox to start with. It involves a lot of you guys. Because, like Phil said, I was at the first Orlando Kayak Fishing Club meeting. Anybody, who, anybody else here that was there that night? Anybody? Gander Mountain? You were there, I think. Yeah, we were doing, I was doing a, a kayak fishing seminar, and then uh, Kurt, Kurt, right, contacted me and wanted to, to bring up this kayak fishing club. I said, sure, bring it on. And out of that, I think 10 people walked out, and that was the beginning of the club. Now, you guys have gotten, gone all the way up to how many members, Max, seven, 100? Um, on the forum and stuff. On the forum? Theoretically, 1,600. 1,600. Reality, we're probably at about eight, nine hundred right now. Right. So eight, nine hundred people on the forum, and you know, I, I've, I've been fortunate to live here all my life in Central Florida, and we're we're in a, we're really blessed to be here because we got so many places to go and fish. We can go camping. We can go hunting. You can, everything, and for all that time, I've been reaching out and taking away from the resource and enjoying it. And now I'm at a point in my life where I feel like it's time to give it back. You know, it's time to give it back or pay it forward, whichever way you want to look at it. And out of that, you know, it all grows out of passion. You know, passion for what you're doing and stuff. And I've been watching this club for seven, eight years now. How many years? Eight, eight years. It's gone from a small group to a huge group, really active people, and now it's kind of fizzling back to a smaller group. And, and I'm, I'm really kind of worried because you guys are a really integral part of our resource here in Central Florida, helping us do the right things. And uh, it's all very important. And some of the things I do, and, and a lot of guys here have helped me, we teach kids to fish. So there's a lot of things you can do. Besides going out and fishing and enjoying the resource, you need to do some things to help it. You know, you can teach kids to fish. You can be part of the cleanups that you guys have been doing. You know, you can attend public meetings. I mean, how many people live here in the Apopka area? Anybody? Lake Apopka's coming on, hot, on real strong. I think in another four or five years, it's gonna be a great resource. So the kayak folks need to be sure to attend those public meetings and say, hey, you know, what about us? Where's our, where's our ramp? You know, what do you, you know, we're, it's all very important. Uh, I'm the president of the AFC, Anglers for Conservation in Orlando. Wade's my vice president. We got a bunch of guys here that helped me uh, do the Hook Kids on Fishing. Last year we did seven events and taught over 700 kids to fish in Orlando. Uh, we've got a lot of things going on with the AFC. We actually have a meeting is it on the 18th mm -hmm. at Fish on Fire. Anybody knows where Fish on Fire is? Uh, and that's our general meeting. We're going to be doing a lot of other things. We've got the uh, gumbo cook-off November 22nd. Er, who, anybody here ever been to gumbo cook-off? Wade, that's it? <laughs> we we work. Work. <laughs> uh, well, the, you ought to be cooking gumbo. No, well, we started the gumbo cook-off with well, actually Fishing Florida Radio is a really great partner of ours. And we're all partners, you know, community partners in the fisheries that we have here. And we're very fortunate to have them. So all I'm asking is that, you know, when you guys, a club like this needs a heart. It needs people to lead it. And, and for you guys that have been, you know, coming in, you know, getting into the club and stuff, it, it can, I, I don't want to see it go away. I don't want to see it go away. It's been, you guys work too hard to get where you're at. And it just takes a little bit of time to do it. Okay. Off the soapbox. And we're going to talk about the mullet run. What is the mullet run anyway? Uh, growing up in Florida, I always have these certain periods of the, and I'm, I'm also a fishing guide. I've been guiding since 95 uh, on the Indian River Lagoon, Mosquito Lagoon out of Port Canaveral, and I've been doing a lot of freshwater lately. 
St. John's River. Uh, I love the shad fishing in the, in the fall. You guys, uh, maybe we have a shad tournament this year again. I don't know. It's up to you guys what you want to do. Huh? What are you trying to tell Let's have some fun. <laughs> Let's have some fun. But uh, one thing I always look forward to is the mullet run. And basically what the mullet, the life cycle of a mullet, and, and, and I know that I'm probably going to be reincarnated as a mullet because <laughs> revenge. Uh, I mean, they've lived their whole life looking over their shoulder. I mean, they're just running all the time. And what happens with mullet, it's a bait fish. And come on in. You know, uh, yeah, got to come into the front of the room. Yeah. When I, well, anyway, also, let me go back up a little bit. Growing up in Florida, fishing all my life, when I was a kid, there was a ton of mullet. They're everywhere. Then the, net, the netters came in, about wiped out the mullet and the redfish everything else. The voters in Florida passed a net ban by like, I forget the amount, but it was over 60% vote in Florida to ban gill nets, which eliminated, and that's probably been about 15 years. And it eliminated a lot of things. It changed the redfish, made it a game fish. And since then the mullet, come on in. You know, so I went from having a lot of mullet to no mullet, and now we're back to having a lot of mullet. We have tons, there's so much mullet now, it's probably more than I've ever seen. And we have two, two species of mullet. We have the silver mullet, which is a uh, tropical species. Then we have the black mullet, which they call them striped mullet, uh, roe mullet, there's a lot of different names for them. And what, what happens with mullet and, and the things you want to look for are, you know, as the daylight gets shorter, you know, as we, anybody notice that it's, uh, I think I got up this morning about 6.30 and it's still dark. You know, we're on the back side of summer. And those shorter days, anybody, those shorter days, uh, the other thing we look for is uh, the northeast prevailing winds and right now which way is the wind direction right now anybody know south. southwest, southwest. It's, it's blowing out and then I always look for is love bugs when you start seeing love bugs again you start going ah love bugs then you start thinking hmm mullet hmm, mullet <laughs> because it's the same window when you start seeing the love bug hatch is when you, the mullet run starts and that's usually when it start, starts cooling off a little bit the life cycle of a mullet, they start out as the big, I'll start with the big row mullet up, up the east coast of the United States. They migrate south in the fall, out into the Gulf of Mexico, believe it or not. Or no, I'm sorry, Gulf Stream. Not Gulf of Mexico, Gulf Stream. Down around Miami, out there, somewhere out there in the middle of nowhere. They school up and they spawn over about two months the females lay probably close to a million eggs, you know, and all those eggs catch, it, catch the Gulf Stream in the wintertime and the fry, and it carries them all the way up the East Coast of the United States up into North Carolina, and all that fry goes back into the estuaries in the spring, and then during that period it all hatches out, grows up, and when the mullet run starts, all that bait comes south again. And when it comes south, you got, you know, two areas where you're going to see them. One is they come out of the estuaries and the lagoons, out of the backwaters. Uh-oh. sorry. And then the other run is down the beach. And that was one Phil was talking about, when they come down the beach. Those fish are on a mission because they, they don't like cold water. Now some of your mullet, your bigger row mullet and stuff, will stay around during the winter. They'll move up, up, up into the creeks where it's warmer, and you'll see a few flipping around here and there. It's also the time of year when the predator fish, when I say predator fish, just about everything eats mullet. 
I mean, uh, Mueller are vegetarians, by the way. Everybody knows that, right? They don't, they don't typically eat uh, anything but plant life, plankton. But the predators will start, they know, time of year again. They know it's time. The bait's coming out. They're going to fatten up. They're going to fatten up for the winter. Now, i got to get my notes so I don't get off track here. Uh, we talked about the history, shorter days, cooler temperatures, love bug hatch, the types of mullet. I guess I'll start with uh, right now. Who's been fishing in the last couple weeks? Anybody? Where were you fishing? Melbourne Beach. Melbourne Beach. You see a mullet on the beach yet? Nope. Nope, not yet. But they're, uh, I was up in Turnbull Creek. Everybody knows where that is this week? And all of this high water, all this rain has pushed them out, and they're all in that little basin right there, and there's, there's just thousands of them in there. And they're staging up, getting ready to, to come on out. But in them, there was a tarpon, a bunch of little tarpon, like, like eight, ten pounders. There was a redfish. But the, the thing about the redfish this time of year is they're getting ready to spawn too. But they're just moving all the time. It's, it's not like this last couple of weeks, it's been you know, the old traditional thing where you go and see them tail and you pull over there, or paddle over there, and you fish. They haven't been doing that, they've been running. So, you, you know, if you'll see a big push coming, you get like two shots and then they're gone, and then you're chasing them. But what they're doing is they're chasing, them, they're working those mullet. Now, there's so many mullet out there right now. And there'll be so many coming up that I always tell people look for fish and, and start fishing. But these days, it's more you have to look for the nervous fish. You know, there's so many. If you see a mullet school swimming along, I wouldn't even focus on that too much. I mean, I, that's the right area. But when you see those mullet start to shower, I mean, you guys know what that? Ever seen that before? Where they all just all of a sudden just all come out at one time? That's a good sign. That means there's something there that you want to catch, something there that you want to get, get your line to. Uh, so one thing about the, the mullet run, it lasts, starts around the love bug hatch, and it'll last about a month, maybe two months. And it doesn't all happen at one time. It doesn't just, doesn't, they just don't come all out and run down the beach. It's all based on the moon and tide. And so You'll see fish, like when you're on the beach fishing. One day you'll be there and there'll be mullet everywhere. And the next day they're gone. So it's a matter of finding them when you're out there. And what I would do, are you kayak fishing off the beach? No. No? Just fishing from the surf? Yeah, but I do have a question on that. Though. Okay. So, it's the theory of laziness. All right. Do I need to patrol up and down yes. the beach? Or can I just park my happy butt? Well, <laughs> what, you know, the That's thing, the, the thing you have to think yeah. about, you know, typically you have your fish that are pressuring the bait, yeah. and along the beach, you're going to, this time of year, you're going to have snook oh, in close. I have been catching some nice bigs, though. Yeah. You're going to have the snook in there, and the reason, the other, I have another theory on the snook on the beach this time of year, and that's, they like, they like uh, sea turtles. Oh. I think they like the little sea turtles. Because uh, I'm ground zero right in that hatch where they're yep. going. Yeah. And when the tur little sea turtles hatch, they snicker on the beach. Uh, but, uh... Bait. Huh? Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, it's a natural thing. I mean, it's... They know, and they're also spawning this time of year in the inlets and the rivers and stuff, but they know that this is the time of year to hit the beach. Yeah. And it starts showing up on the beach. Because the snook have been big, too. Yeah. They're big and, and they're fun to catch. And the nice thing about out there is they don't have anywhere to cut you off. No. You know, they can, they can still cut you with their gill plate, cut your line. But the, uh, the mullet run up the beach in, in waves or, or like pulses of bait. So what I always do is I go out there and even in my skiff when I run the beach, I might run the whole beach. Right. And then all of a sudden I see a pot of bait. I see pelicans diving. Right. You see the birds working them. That's what you want to look for. 
And a lot of times, you, if you watch them, you can pull up like to the crossovers and stuff and just sit up there in the morning and watch. And if you see birds diving and stuff, typically the bait's moving, moving south down the beach. So you can actually set up ahead of it sometimes. Okay. So I see that, that activity of which you're so being on the beach physically, you're limited as the right. is there a time when they're gonna come close in or a predator's gonna chase them close in. They're gonna chase them in. Okay. You know, that's the thing is, you know, like like the bait mullet. Typically right now, the mullet I'm seeing, and you'll see during the run, they're gonna be all the way up against the shoreline in the flat. Well that's good. Yeah, because they don't want anything eating them. You know, they're coming up there. They're going to get as shallow as they can. So when you're out there kayak fishing, you want to, you know, work your, I would stick close to the shoreline. Okay. And then the other thing is, is eventually they come down, say they're in the lagoon. Uh, a good area, I'll tell you some really good areas to fish them. Uh, behind the clinker islands. Yeah. In shallow. On that west shore. You know, where they get, what they do is they swim in there, they get up against the shoreline, and they follow the shoreline down. Eventually, they got to get into the Holliver Canal. And they're out in open water. That's a little different situation. They don't like that. But they have to do it. So the, those ambush spots, like the ends of the jetties, or the ends of, uh, say, the causeways, you know, because they'll swim along the east shore, say, uh, Peacock's Pocket is a great kayak spot. They'll work that east shore, they'll come out of the Banana Creek, they'll work that east shore all the way down to the NASA Causeway. And then they gotta go down the causeway, they don't have no choice, they're going south. And then they have to get out in that open water. So those places, ambush spots, the deeper areas, are good places to look for. Uh, on the beach, the same thing. So they run the beach and then when they get to the inlet, they, get, they pack up right there to the jetties and then they'll come around and, and everything will be pounding on them right there. You know, you'll have the tarpon in there. Uh, if it gets a little further off the beach, the kingfish will be in there. Bluefish, Spanish mackerel. I mean, just about anything you can imagine will be in there on those fish. Uh, and there's different things you can do. You can use artificial baits if that's what you like to do. Or actually the li little live, when you match the hatch with a little live mullet. You know, right now those tarpon, they won't eat anything. And if you go up, say, right now you can go up to, uh, everybody know where Turnbull Creek is? We'll get the maps out here. There's, I was in there last week. Of course it was the super moon, which, which I hate that. I don't know how you guys feel about it, but I'd never catch fish on a big moon. And there were hundreds of tarpon in there, rolling, and, and the guys I was fishing with were throwing lures. We were throwing little soft DOA cow tails, and the fish would hit them, but that's all they would do. They'd just come up and, and hit them, and then and we can catch a fish. But if you get a little finger mullet about like that, and you little small circle hook, and you just free line them out there, you're going to catch uh, tarpon right now. And so I use, I'm one of these guys, I'm not a purist, you know, I don't just, certain, some people, uh, I only fish with lures, you know, and me, I look at my clients and I say, just like the other day, I had two guys from New York City, stock brokers down here, they were gator hunting, they got two gators and they were going, they went out with me. I could look at one cat, the first cast, I can say, nope. It's not going to be a lure day today. It's going to be a bait day. And that's what I do. I fish for bait when it comes down to it. Uh, and so I switched to bait, and they got, they got three redfish, and they were real nice and happy. Uh, things that I like, I'll show you some different lures. you got to remember that, and see what happens when, when they have the mullet run, is the fish are all looking for mullet. They're swimming fast, and they're looking up. So... You know, we don't, I don't think about shrimp and crabs and stuff like that this time of year. I think about using mullet for bait or mullet imitation lures. There's a lot of them out there. This is one of my favorites. And it's a real easy bait to use. 
and it's just a bait buster. Shallow running DOA bait buster. It's about the easiest bait. If you can cast, you can catch fish with this. Yes, sir. Did you try to cast net for some mullet for bait? Yes. Yep. I'll do that. Uh, usually when the guys can't throw the lures. <laughs> or, because if you're throwing lures, you, you know, if you can't cast 50 feet and you're in a skiff, you're not going to catch anything. You know, you got to be able to really cast and reach out to the fish. And these guys didn't even know how to, use, to hold the rod, you know, so. But, yeah, I use a live mullet, and I can show you, I can tell you how I rig them when I do that. I'm going to start with this one. This is the DOA bait buster, just a long cast. And you want to reel it, steady reel retrieval, to where it's just under the water. And so it looks like a waking You've seen a redfish wake when they go around. It's the same, same thing. This is a shallow running one, which has a, the eye of the hook is right in the middle. It, it, it's great. This is one I would use on the flats. And then the deep running one has a hook here, and it's heavier weighted. So if I was on the beach, maybe that's probably what I would throw, the deep, the deep one. Did you just say you are doing a steady retrieve? Yeah, just a steady retrieve. So you're not working it at all? No. No, you... And it's what happens a lot. Now, one thing you want to do, and I see I fish kind of unique. I don't say unique, but uh, I fish just braided line, so there's no stretch. So when you throw it out there, just a steady retrieve. Like if you see like redfish, say say a school of redfish, you throw it out, steady retrieval, and when they start coming and hitting at it or chasing it, keep reeling because they're used to chasing stuff. They're not used to things waiting for them. And they'll miss it. You know, redfish has their mouth on the bottom of their head. So when they turn up to strike the top, they actually have to kind of roll over. And, and a redfish will miss the bait probably four out of five times before he gets it. But they'll keep going after it? Yeah, if you keep reeling it. They just keep reeling it. Yep, and then if it gets close to the boat, if he's chasing it and it gets, say, within 20 feet of the boat, I'd snatch it away from him so he doesn't see the boat. Okay. If he sees the boat, he's gone. Uh, but yeah, that's red. Now trout will do. The trout will come up and just pop at it, you know. Uh, but I like the bait buster. The only thing about it, when you're fishing off the beach with it, is you have a lot of toothy critters on the beach. You know, and they'll, if you're fishing with braid. Uh, or fishing with this, I use fluorocarbon leader, a bluefish, Spanish mackerel, shark. They'll just go right through it. Uh, and the trick there, if you do end up in that situation, is to reel it real fast. Work it real fast. So when they come up to strike at it, they're coming in from behind it. And they won't get your leader as much. But I mean, this is about, what do these cost? About five bucks? Five bucks. Yeah, you don't want to lose it. So you can actually put a trace of steel on here, steel leader, if you get into the bigger fish. And if you're going to fish snook with this, I would go to 30 or 40 pound uh, leader. I usually use 20 on uh, redfish and trout. Now, other things you can throw, especially around the toothy critters, is the spoon. This, you know, I can pass that around. This is a uh, Aqua Dreams mullet spoon. Uh, it's a great lure, guard. huh? It's a what's that? With the weed guard. Yeah, with the weed guard. You got a lot of grass this time of year. That's one thing about this bait too. I wanted to, good point. Single hook, you're not going to get as much grass as you are going with treble hooks. Oh yeah, you will. <laughs> it's just part of it. And you know what? One thing I see every day on my boat, and I don't know how you guys kayak fishermen probably, probably have this figured out, but all my guys that fish with me that don't know anything about it get the weeds on there, and they hold the rod like this, and they go, <laughs> you know, just, just do this, you know, and pick your weeds off. And when you're in a kayak, I can see this being a lot easier. Uh, and the other thing they do is this on the boat, you know, you don't want to do that either, don't want to do that either, uh, 
Again, think about mullet when you're matching the hatch. You know, you can't go wrong. I love top water fishing, especially first thing in the morning. Uh, got the Zara Spook here. And this one here is a skitter walk. Both of these are great little baits. The only thing is you got treble hooks. You're going to have a lot of weeds. On top of that, a lot of hooks. <laughs> I mean, and uh, so a lot of times what I do, and I, I should have brought one in with me, but especially when you get on the surf and you got a lot of, a lot of blue fish and stuff like that, is I'll actually take the hooks off and then I'll put a single circle hook on the back. Instead of having all those trebles, I got one hook. And then the, the other thing you got to do when you do that is you have to add another split ring. With it, I should have brought one to show you. But you put another split ring on there so your hook, you know, if you look at the way these things are set up, the hook will be yeah, the hook will be sideways if you don't put another. Now, You know, there's a lot of different baits out there that look like mullet these days. I'm not going to open this up. This belongs to Rory, but you can pass that around. You can pass these around if you want. They're not mine. They belong to Mosquito Creek. <laughs> <laughs> if you want to buy it, you just go take it up to Rory and buy one. Uh, a lot of times on the beach, just, you know, uh, if I was going to fish from the beach too, now the snook fishing like Dennis is talking about is I do, my favorite way is a live mullet. And then uh, what I do, the snook like the, the very edge of the surf. They're not out deep. You don't have to cast a long way to get to them. Uh, one thing I would do if I was going to go out there is, is beef up my tackle. You don't want to, I mean, you could catch them on this. This is only 10 pound test line, which you probably, huh? What is that? What, is that a 5,000 or 4,000? This is a uh, 3,500 acceler. It's got plenty of line on it. And you could put 20 pound, if I was going to go fishing the beach, I would have put at least 20 pound test line minimum. How big of a mullet would you put on that? What's the biggest you would put live? Eight, 10 inches. I mean, <laughs> typically I would like those little ones, you know, probably three to four inches long. But most of those fish out there will eat. I mean, you take a, and th see, the thing you got to be ready because you could catch a, a flounder. You can catch redfish, but you can handle both of those with this. You can handle bluefish with this. You can handle Spanish mackerel. But the 120 pound tarpon is going to spool you in a heartbeat. The spinner, we get these spinner sharks out there this time of year. Uh, anybody here ever catch a spinner shark? Uh, that's what's going on right now. They just come right up out of the bottom. And the only thing you can do with a rod like this is, is, is grab your line and just let it go. And, then, and your lure is gone because you're not going to stop them with this if you're standing on the beach. Now, if you're in a kayak, you can kind of follow them around for a while, maybe get them. You know, you can catch giant fish in a kayak. And that's one of the advantages of right now, this year, it's been, it's been a really strange year. We've had a lot of rain. And see, I'm pretty good at predicting what goes on. I've been writing fishing forecasts for over 15 years. And it doesn't change, usually doesn't change a lot. But this year's thrown me for a loop. We haven't had any cold water this year. Typically, it's the time of year we get the cold water upwellings. I don't know where they're at. We've got the west winds. We've got all the things that normally bring them. But, uh, you know, it's not happening. So the water. Did it? Starting to cool off? Yeah, because I went two days and my wife even commented, you know, water's cooling down. Yeah. Well, normally this time of year, we get the coldest water of the year off the beach. I mean, I've seen years where it got down to like 50 degrees. And everybody, everybody knows what's going on, right? It's called, it's a centrifugal force. The earth spins. The Coriolis, the Coriolis effect, yeah. And so when you get the west wind, it pushes the warm water off the top. 
out into the Gulf Stream and the cold water comes up. That's all there is to it. What ends up happening a lot of times is that the fish that don't like cold water, they're going to find them some warm water. They're either going to go out in the Gulf Stream or they're going to come in close to the shore. And a lot of times they come in close and, and then we normally have a good cobia run this time of year. Uh, but like it's, and then also the big redfish, if you're fishing out off the beach, we've had some really big redfish schools out there this year. And they come off the reefs and stuff, I think. This is my theory. And move in there where the water's warmer. You know, uh, I, got, I, got, I don't know how to explain it. I call it School X. It's really hard to find it. You ever heard of School X? It's a giant, I mean, I've seen, you've probably seen videos of it on Facebook. It's like 10 acres of redfish stacked like five deep. And they'll come up on the top and, and eat anything you throw at them. But finding them is the trick because they could be anywhere from Ponce Inlet to Sebastian. Uh, they've been right off of uh, the bite of the Cape here the last couple months. And I've been, out, I've been out four times looking for them and only found them once. So, you know, uh, but anyway, that's that. Let's see. How fast do they travel? The redfish, the school X, pretty fast. You know, once they're on a mission, and usually you got to set up in front of them, you get a hook up or two, and then they're, then you're hunting for them again. Uh, one of my, Phil Wolf, the guy that owns the Orlando Coastal Angler, his son got in them the other day, and they had four. I don't know if you saw the picture on Facebook, but they landed four giant redfish. There's four guys on the boat. Each one caught a, you know, 30 to 40 pound redfish. And they got a photo of all four of them standing on the deck of the boat with a fish. Uh, so anyway, let's see what I got left here. Talk about the different fish. I think I've about covered it all. Uh, normally what I do, and, and like, I like Dennis does, one of my favorite things is just go down there to like, and usually a place I usually go is like Patrick Air Force Base in that area, and look for mullet in the surf. Normally the best thing to do if you're gonna net mullet is to catch them before you get there. And a good spot is like any of the causeways you cross. Is a good spot where you can just pull off the road, you know, spend a, and sometimes it's pretty easy, sometimes it's hard. But get yourself a couple dozen mullet because the thing is, if you're sitting on the beach, you have a bucket of bait. And if you put 30 mullet in that one bucket, they're not going to live very long. So you get you a dozen really nice baits, aerator, keep them alive. Uh, this time of year, you can throw a little ice in there, kind of keep them cool. But you get on the beach, and when I do, I don't have any leader with me. But I use a 20-pound test for line, braided line, uh, 30 to 40-pound, probably 40-pound leader. What size leader are you using for snook? 40. Because hey, everybody here ever catch a snook? Who hasn't caught a snook? They're a great fish. Wonderful game fish, fun to catch, but they have a sharp gill plate on the side of their head. Don't grab one by around the head, because he'll, he'll slice you up. And what they like to do in the surf, and Dennis probably knows this, they get out there in the surf, and then they turn sideways in that wave. You're not moving. Huh? You're not moving. No, but that, <laughs> your line is right up against that gill plate. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, they're gone, you know, just like that. So, uh, and you have to remember too that I think snook is out of season, right, until yes. September 1st. Yes. Yes. So you can't keep them. So, you know, uh, get your photo and put them back. But what I usually do is just I get a little slip sinker and, you know, and I used to use a really big circle hook. But I've actually found lately that I catch as many fish or more fish on that little circle, small circle hook. But just, you, you know, you can hook them. Usually what I'll do is I'll hook them through the bottom of the tail with about a half ounce sinker on there and a little split shot to keep them from, and when you throw them out, and this works on the flat too, is they, they're always trying to swim up 
or swim away. And that sinker holds them down. And so what they end up doing is they're doing this in the wave or up on the surface of the water, which is what you want them doing. They want them flopping around. And then as you, you know, you have on the beach, you have tide. It's the water's running one way or the other. And if you stand, if you, if you just flip your bait out, say from here to that kayak, and you throw it out there and you let it sit there and you stand in one spot, what's going to end up happening is it's going to rotate around in about three or four minutes, depending on how fast the tide's running. It's going to be right up here on the edge of the bank. So what I'll do is I'll flip it out there and I'll try to find an area where I can do this. Sometimes you can't do it because of the people on the beach. But then as it's rolling down the beach, I'll just walk along with it. Try to keep it in that strike zone a little longer, you know. That seems to work good. Uh, when you get to hit, I mean, there's the bad thing about fishing off the beach, you can't chase the fish. So depending on what it is, uh, if you're not set up right, it's not you're not going to catch it. And I don't know how many times I've I ever had to break off fish because I just knew I couldn't stop them. You know, either tarpon or spinner shark or something like that. Uh, one thing I don't like to do is kill fish if I don't have to. Uh, that's the other reason why I use a heavier tackle out there. Uh, any questions? There's going to be an article in Coastal Angler next month. Actually, it should be coming out pretty soon on uh, the mullet run, everything we talked about. Uh, anybody have any questions? When you're free line finger mullet, how are you hooking them? Usually what I do is I hook them up through the bottom of the tail. Same way you were saying? Yeah. So they're swimming up. When, if, you hook, if you want a mullet to swim deep, you hook them in the top of the tail. And then he's going to pull down this way. If you want him to swim shallow, you hook him in the bottom like this, and he'll swim up to the top, and he'll flop. And see, when you're out on the flats, a lot of times, and you stake out your boat or you're on a sandbar or whatever, you're in a kayak, you're going to fish more than one rod. Say you're going to fish three rods. If you take that weight, a split shot, you know, you got your line, your hook. I put those, just a barrel sinker on there and a piece of split shot to keep it Whatever, whatever, whatever depth you want your mullet to be at. And you throw one out over there, put it in the rod holder. Throw one out over here, put it in the rod holder, one over there. And that weight's going to keep that bait from, any, how many people's free-lined the mullet before? You throw them out, and next thing you know, he's swimming underneath the boat. <laughs> you know, that weight's going to keep him in that area. And he's just going to stay there swimming towards the top, making all that noise, all that vibration and stuff. Uh, so I use the same thing on the flats. The only thing is on the surf, I'll walk along with it. In a kayak, you could probably just drift along. You know, if you're out off the beach, I would be, I would be throwing in towards the shore and drift along, keep that bait in close to the beach, because that's where the mullet are going to be at most of the time. Uh, and one good thing I was going to say about this year the doldrums have last, lasted a lot longer this year. Right now, you could, you could take a kayak off the beach anywhere. Yeah. I mean, it's flat. Yeah. You know, as long as you have this west wind or the south wind, you, know, you shouldn't have much problem with that. How clear is the water right now? I'm really impressed this year. Uh, some of the things we did, I don't know if you guys, last year we had such bad problems with the algae blooms. Yeah, this year. It's not bad this year, so far. Now, I'd did you see where, like in Titusville and stuff, they're doing the restrictions? Yes. That yeah, it is. But there's, they're, they're have, they have a lot of challenges, too, because uh, the big fertilizer companies are suing them. Oh. They're, they're starting to sue, like, Brevard County and, oh. you know. Uh, so that's where we have to step in. And some of the things we did last year, I don't know. Well, we had the big algae bloom last year. And, well, we actually had it, like, three years, and I've... I've been really upset because I've been kind of thinking along the long lines that we're, it's, we're going to be have some dead water pretty soon because the algae bloom shade out the grass. The grass goes away. There's no bait. There's nowhere for shrimp to hide. There's nowhere for little trout to hide. I don't know if you remember the, like the first year we had it. We were catching all these big giant trout. 
Remember that? Because they were eating all the little trout, and we couldn't catch no little trout. Now this year we have, we have grasses back, and pretty good in most areas, and we're catching a lot of little trout again. Uh, Indian River's been pretty good. I've been fishing in the Titusville area. It's been pretty clean. I mean, I was in four foot of water the other day and I could see the bottom, which last year you couldn't see your hand that deep. You know, so it's looking good. Now, I've also noticed a lot of the guides that fish down in the Banana River have been up in my area, which tells me that their waters get pretty dirty. So I've heard that the Banana River down around Patrick Air Force Base and that area what is... There's fish kills all over a lot of times. I didn't see any fish. Merritt Island on the Banana River, or Indian, I mean on the Indian or the that Mosquito Lagoon? I don't know what river it was, but I heard it was like Merritt Island heading north. So. I haven't seen that much. I've seen a little bit. I've seen some on the St. John's. But it's, that's normal this time of year when we have the rain. The rain. Yeah, you get the low oxygen in the water. But I haven't seen any bad fish kills this year. Uh, and then, you know, like I said, the beach has been really good fishing typically. A lot of tarpon this year. Uh, but then again, you have to be in the right place at the right time. And that's where, you know, if I was going to fish the beach, I would ride around in my car for a while with my field glasses out. and Oh, I see some birds diving over there. That's where I'm going to fish. You know, uh, same thing on the flats. You see all the herons in the water. You know, they're there for, they're there for a reason. You know. Yes, sir. What about the West Coast? That's out of my game park. I don't. <laughs> I, I do fish over there once in a while, but I usually go fishing with somebody. I'm not really familiar with it. But since you asked, what part of the West Coast do you fish? Yeah, I so I don't think I got that. <laughs> Bradington Tarpon Springs, where's that at? That's like Tampa, right? Uh, Bradington. Actually, it makes a good question, too, because you were talking about the mullet run on the East Coast. Mm -hmm. I've spent a lot of time on the, on the Florida West Coast and, and talking about the, the mullet industry up mm -hmm. on Appalachia and the Bears. Yes. So do those mullet migrate the same way? I mean, I think they go up in like the the, the Louisiana, okay, in so Texas bayous. Texas. Yeah, and then they come down. And I'm not real familiar with that yeah. how that works over there. Uh, I, I've seen them in the springtime headed back north toward yeah. the uh, Big Bend area. Right. And in the fall headed south. I right. assume they're headed down towards Everglades. Yes. And, right. You know, but yeah. There's a huge, was a huge mullet industry. It's still there, but it's it's, there, it's yeah. difficult to, you know, uh, we we have we have the mullet fishermen here too, and they usually target the row mullet in the fall when they're coming back. Right. That's when they're the biggest, and they're and they're working their way around to the Gulf Stream there. And, and they're still using them. Huh? And they're still using them. Yeah, and they're great. Mullet are great eating. Oh yeah. Know. You know, yes sir. Hey, another question. Especially in the spring of the year over on the West Coast. Okay. We'll get large, you know, several hundred or a thousand mullet. Mm -hmm. And they'll be right up on the surface with their dorsals and their top tail fins out yeah. of the water, mm -hmm. popping the water. Mm -hmm. what you, what's going on? I don't know. Anybody, can anybody help me with that one? <laughs> <laughs> I guess they're eating, they're feeding, or yeah, so I or, or maybe. The surface, see, or? the thing too about mullet is a lot of times they they don't need a lot of oxygen in the water. I've I actually seen, there. I've actually well, seen them, yeah. I've seen them do that where they breathe air. I think they're there. And then also mullet. I don't know if everybody knows it, but mullet has a gizzard, right. like a chicken. Right. Uh, you can eat them. Yeah. Yeah. You, can, yeah, you, can, you gotta clean them out, get all, cut them up, and get the sand out of them. But yeah, they have a, bacon. yep. Sometimes when they're doing that, it's mm -hmm. really good fishing along the edges mm -hmm. of the mullet. Well, and sometimes there's another thing there. Yeah, well, see, when and I talk about this in some of my other articles and stuff, and I've experienced this a lot of times. You take a big school of mullet, and they're they're running down the flat, heading south, say Nassau Causeway or Peacock's Pocket or in any of those areas. 
as they're going, they're feeding, they're stirring up the bottom. And usually if you look, if you can see into the school, you'll see there's redfish in there with them and there's trout in there with them. And a lot of times they're eating what the mullet are spooking out. So you can actually, in those cases, I've actually used like a DOA shrimp or live shrimp, which live shrimp this time of year, you're not gonna, pinfish, you're gonna eat it up. I mean, it's gonna be gone just like that. But, uh, you know, fishing around those big schools of bait, of mullet like you're talking about, underneath them sometimes is really good. And then the, uh, how many people have ever caught a pinfish in the north end of the Indian River around say uh, the Turnbull Creek area. Anybody ever catch one? They're hard to catch there. There's too much fresh water right now. They don't like fresh water. Yeah, they were at Play Linda the other day. Yeah, they're at Play Linda and they're down, you know, like if you go down like the south Mosquito Lagoon around Turtle Pen or that area, they'll tear you up. But, uh, oh <laughs> and then there's been a lot of black drum schools. I don't know if you guys have seen any of those. It's hard to find the black yeah, you know, go out, launch it. Uh, Could hang it out of Turnbull. I mean, yeah. Tarpon, well, sure. up against that west shore, yeah. between the uh, Scottsmore ramp and the creek, oh, okay. there have been some schools in there. They're down around, uh, you know, where Flounder Creek is. Yeah. Along the shoreline in there. Down Carbide. Carbide Flat, Bio Lab. Flat there. No, I haven't. I almost went in there the other day, but I didn't. I went, uh, went as far as Banana Creek. And, uh, you know, the water river is really, really high right now. See, and that's the other thing about that Coriolis effect. When it does come in, it usually sucks all the water out of, out of the lagoon. And we'll have real low water in the middle of the summer, and everybody's going, why is the water so low? It's been raining every day. But that hasn't happened this year. So, you know, I, I made a prediction, and I guess I was like the weatherman. I was wrong. <laughs> you know. Thank you, Tony Manolo. Yep. Uh, question, sir, back. You were fishing with the pinfish. How do you, you going to fish them a lot? How do you hook them? Uh, I usually cut them up. <laughs> I usually cut them up if I'm using pinfish for bait, which is a good bait for redfish. Yeah. Uh, you can use the whole ones if you're in an area where you know there's big fish, like say the Hullover Canal. Uh, when I use a live pinfish, I usually cut the dorsal fin with a pair of scissors so it's not sticking up, you know how to, and then just hook them through the uh, anal, near the anal fin, and use that same sinker, let them swim. Same theory as the mullet. Yeah, same theory as the mullet. And that's, yeah, something else that's happen hasn't happened this year is normally this time of year there's a big flush of blue crabs that comes through the Hollover Canal going out uh, into the Mosquito Lagoon and then out to the I haven't seen that this year I haven't seen the big the big black drum in the Hollover Canal this year normally this time of year I can put my fish finder on my boat and ride down through there and go oh there they are you know put my stop lock on my trolling motor down and flip a piece of crab out there and I mean I bet we caught in July last year we probably caught on my boat they probably caught 200 uh, black drum you know 20 pounders haven't caught one this year haven't seen the fish in here I go through that canal and I've got I've got the other cool thing I got is a hummingbird and I haven't quite figured it out because it's like my cell phone it's got so many things but it has the side imaging on it Oh uh, man, if you, I don't think you use, I don't, I guess you could use that on a kayak, couldn't you? Yep. But uh, you got side, side imaging? That's cool, isn't it? You know, you can see, uh, I can actually drive down a Hollover Canal when the fish are in there and I can see the schools on the bottom laying there. It's red fish and black drum, the bigger fish. Uh, but that, you know, this year's kind of strange. I mean, there's a lot of things going on that, I haven't been on, you know, it's just not the same as it normally is. Uh, Has anybody been using, I forgot what you called, the little hover things that go up and go around? Has anybody used those? A drone. 
A drone? Yeah. Just to play Lone Beach. Well, I mean, you know, oh, taking pictures of. Or... Have a, a higher view. Of what yeah, you uh, yeah, you could remote. do that. Well, I, I was really fortunate this year. Uh, because I'm an outdoor rider and I've been in the industry a while, I actually got to fish in the Bassmaster Classic this year as a as a uh, marshal, which is the guy who sits in the boat and keeps keeps communications and lets them know what's going on. And I swear, we were out in the middle of Lake Gunnersville, and it must have been ESPN or somebody, but those drones were like, you're out there fishing, and all of a sudden, down here looking at you. <laughs> what the hell is that? I mean, but yeah, they're all over the place. So yeah, you could, I mean, if you had one, that would be really. Couldn't you just get a bunch of them and just herd the fish toward your view? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. No, they're coming down. I think they're about, what, 600 now, aren't they? You know, and GoPro's got them, you know, as an accessory where you can do that. But, yeah, they're all over the place. I, I never have thought about fishing for that. I actually thought about having, like, a little service, you know, with an airplane where I fly around and look. And, and then I have subscribers that I send a little text on where the school is. You might be to start a whole new... Uh, huh? They used to do that with, in the Gulf there with the uh, spot in the uh, big movie. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, they used to do that commercial. But, uh, okay, anybody else? Now, uh, the other thing I do, and if you, I think most of you guys are probably already, already on it, but I do like a, a fishing report and a forecast every month. Of course, my forecast is way off this month, so, you know, it's, you know, uh, I'm still waiting for the cold water to get in. It hasn't showed up, but you say it's here, starting to. Yeah, well, that, that cold water will push them in. It pushes them right into the edge of the beach because, you know, they don't like it. And the bottom fishing out there, like the snapper and all that, they, they, they don't catch them, you know, when it's cold. And I've seen, I haven't seen it this year, but like down at Sebastian, where it gets so cold that the mutton snapper die in the summertime and come floating up. You know, because mutton snapper is more of a tropical species. Uh, but that hasn't happened this year either. Uh, you want to look at some charts, you said? How much uh, time we got? Uh, it all depends on, on the team here. You know, Rory and these guys. Uh, do you want me to do the, pull the map? Or no, no, you, can, you stay seated. Yeah, I'm Mm-hmm. I was going to talk about some places that I think would be good, but this is not the right map. Well, this is no motor zone right here, isn't it? Right. Yep. You want uh, This works. The uh, the places I would fish in here, of course, is this west shoreline. Uh, if you can make it all the way up to the causeway, which is about seven miles, uh, there's usually a lot of bait right in through here. A lot of snook right along the edge of the edge of the shoreline. That is a deep paddle. Is, that up it is. Creek? yeah. Yep. Well, all the way down, but up by Bucks Creek is where I like to fish. Uh, the only situation we've had that southwest wind, and you probably wouldn't want to go there on a southwest wind because it's going to be in your face on the way back. That's the bad thing about this area. Uh, up here in Moores Creek, or this Banana Creek in here in Peacock's Pocket, this is a great spot to fish. The other thing you can do if you can find culverts that are flowing, uh, unfortunately the Park Service, or, or uh, I guess they've been opening up a lot of the dikes, so the cul old culverts that we had that were old reliable fishing holes have kind of uh, gone away. The culverts are still there, but there's no water flowing out of them. But there's a set of culverts up in here in Peacock's Pocket that's pretty good. And then there's some more in these other creeks here. Catfish Creek, which I think is right there. And Gator Creek and those areas. And the mouths of those little pockets are pretty good. So if you were to kayak fishing, you could probably launch them, you know, uh, early, early in the morning. Like you were, you were talking, who was talking about night fishing? That would be a good one to do. If you get over here on the causeway, this is the Max Brewer causeway, and then you launch, 
and you can either go this map doesn't go up in here but if you go north there's a little creek up in there if you stay shallow you don't have to worry about big boats running you over <laughs> at night you know what i'm saying uh so that would be a good place to go if you're going to try night fishing would be to go uh, around the railroad bridge yeah if you well there's there's i guess you could launch at the carbide ramp there that's uh that's a pretty good paddle. Yeah, with the intercoastal in between. Yeah. And see, I've, I've never been real confident with that landing there by the carb, what do they call the landing right there by the carbide plant? Uh, yeah, Mims. Um, Whatever it is, but Jones Creek. Jones Creek. Uh, it's not a really good neighborhood, you know, especially if you're going to leave your car there at it's night. The start of the uh, zombie apocalypse will happen there. So. Probably. It already has, I think. Uh, you can launch up there at uh, Hallover Canal. Yeah. Around that corner yeah. too. That's pretty well, good. Fish. Well, one place I like to, and see, there's a lot of, I actually catch a lot of snook, or you, I haven't caught any this year, but in the past I've caught a lot of snook at night around the Hollover Canal. And the place I, I can't show it here, I don't think we got the Hollover. You got the Hollover on here? Yep. Okay, you can watch at Bears Cove. And I don't know if anybody's ever seen this little slough. If you go into the Banana River, which would be west, there's a little slough there right when you come out of the Bears Cove that cuts back behind. It's like a shortcut. It's right here. It comes out on this flat. Going towards Granny's Cove? Yeah, going towards Granny's. And that would be a good place to go at night. You know, because I've actually, this is my sleeping spot. A lot of times when I have double charters, I can take my boat and I'll go up that little creek if I'm waiting on somebody and take me a little nap. Because nobody ever hardly goes up there. And it's real shallow getting in onto this flat. But, you know, some neat things about this area, which is, this map, it's hard to see it on here. Uh, but the edge, I don't know if you guys, you guys probably have to pass this around. But you see the flat's only a foot deep. Right, but in here there's a slough that they dug out years ago when this was a marina and all that stuff. It's five to six foot deep, right up against the shoreline, and it runs all the way back down to that little. There's a little canal that cuts in behind and towards the you know grannies right here and all this area back in here. I don't think you're going to run into anybody with boats fishing hardly. Hmm. You know, so that would be good, and That's and the other. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, you go right on out, like you go out the boat launch and you start paddling west mm -hmm. towards the Indian River. Right. And on the left, right there when you go out, the dolphins are always swimming right there on top of that sandbar. Gallinipper Huh? Gallinipper I think Well, now Gallinipper is on the Mosquito Lagoon down here, but which is also a good area, Eddy Creek, but that closes. You know, they lock the gates on that. You know, so you can't get in there in early. Uh, but that deep, that little deep trench there, and the same thing if you know if you go back a little further, the Boy Scout camp. You know how you launch back there on uh, Dummett's Creek. Mm -hmm. That little I shouldn't tell you guys about that, but that little deep hole is filled with trout in the winter time. I mean, because you got a shallow flat, and all of a sudden you have right next to the shore, you've got a a ditch that's five to six feet deep, and it's full of fish in the winter time. Uh, and you have the same thing, which which you can do this too. And a lot of people don't realize this, but down here, where if you do launch at the carbide. And so you can go north to the railroad bridge if you want to. But if you go south and you stick to the shoreline, there's a trough that runs all, all the way down through there. For miles. Yeah, the where they dug out for the railroad right. uh, years the ago. Old uh, canal. Huh? The, the old Mims Canal. Is that what they call it? Yeah. It used to have a ferry boat between um, Scottsmore and Mims. Oh, really? No, no, no. Carry supplies. I didn't know that. That's why they dug it. Okay, I thought I dug it out for the railroad. What was it for, Bill? It's, uh, the Mims Canal, he said. The old Mims Canal. It was a uh, barge canal. Okay. 
Well, that explains the big ass barge that's back there. Yeah. <laughs> well, there's a there's a boat that's sunk back there that yeah. somebody yeah somebody abandoned it. But I was actually there's that is pretty good this time of year because there are culverts that flow there. Mm -hmm. Plus, it's deep. So yeah. It's cooler. Yeah. And they come out on the flats. Mm -hmm. But when these creeks come out and that water's flowing, that's where you're going to find your snook at. Mm -hmm. right up, and ladyfish, you just flip right up into the flowing water and they'll be laying in there. Tom, where do you turn in off of US 1 to get back to that carbide plant launch point? Uh, it's, um, this is showing it's kind of hard to explain. Whaley Avenue. You basically take one of those dirt trails. And then you'll find it's not carbide plant anymore. It's called. Um, Union, it's Union Carbide, right? No, it's um, A something. Anyway, once you find the plant, there are signs for the plant, and then you uh, just follow the. Take a uh, left, right where the plant is. Yeah. And then right. Mm -hmm. and you're there. And then when you see a bunch of debris yeah, and garbage and mm -hmm. well geese that yep. can attack you, you're there. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, I'll close with that. The big barge. Uh, I know. I know Rory's probably wanting to go home. And how long you been here now? All day. Uh, pretty much. Uh, I just wanted to do uh, before we quit. I just wanted to thank everybody. I know a lot of you guys helped us with our hook kids on fishing stuff this year. We've already got. We're working on uh, next year's plan. We've got four or five events next year. If you want to do a hook kids on fishing event, uh, it's a lot of fun. The other thing we got is our gumbo cook-off coming up. You work at Universal or Disney? Disney. Universal snaked us on our gumbo cook-off. Oh, they took the idea? Oh, they took our name and the idea. Oh, nice. Yeah. Well, they got figured a little weird. We can't, we can't call it Gumbo Palooza anymore. They trademarked the name and, and took it from us. So it's the, it's the AFC Gumbo Wars this year. <laughs> and if you guys haven't been, it's a blast. And all of the money we're going to make this year goes to kids' fishing events, not just ours, but uh, the bass fishing clubs and different stuff out here. So, Where's it going, baby? Fish on Fire restaurant, uh, November 22nd, the weekend before Thanksgiving. And uh, if you want to cook gumbo, we got some slots open. And uh, I'll turn it over to you, sir. You want to cook gumbo? You're a chef. I mean, I'm not a chef. Oh, oh, you're not. Just at home. Oh, I thought you were. No, I manage. Oh, you manage the restaurant. It's even better. Then you can tell the chefs to cook you up some gumbo and bring it down there and put it up there. Yeah, I'll have to look into them though. Yeah, it's a lot of fun and basically we have it's 50 bucks to enter each team, and you win half of that and uh, bragging rights, you know, and we're, we did good. Well, the first year we raised, we got 3,200 bucks for the Hook Kids on Fishing, and they raised, uh, last year they raised $26,000, and we got $1,000 of it, Universal took the rest of it, you know, huh? Yeah, that's not, they're not going to do it this year. Well, send, uh, send me the dates on the check. Okay. Oh, I'll do that. You want to cl close up with anything? or? Uh, no, I guess we'll, uh, next month we won't have a speaker. We'll be doing kayaks.